Starting your own practice is hard for many chiropractors. It's riddled with both struggles and successes. But here at the Chiropractic Philanthropist, we make it easy by having chiropreneurs and entrepreneurs share their struggles and lessons learned in life and business so that you don't have to make the same mistakes. And now here's your host, Dr. Ed Osborne. Hey doc, want to start a successful social media marketing campaign that will get you anywhere from 10 to 45 qualified new patients contacting you for appointments? Of course you would. You probably already have been shown how to do it, so why haven't you implemented? Most doctors don't have the time and they don't care to spend the money trying to figure out what methods work. 3S Chiropractic Systems has put in the time for you and have been testing the methods for years, so if you want to surge new patients every month, that's it, right at your fingertips. The company is run by chiropractors with years of web and social media marketing experience offering you a complete, affordable, done-for-you package. Get this system. It's swooping across the globe and is geographically exclusive, so find out right now if your area is still available. They offer full money-back guarantee for the first month, so there is absolutely no risk. Apply at 3schiropracticsystems.com forward slash TCP to make sure you don't miss out. All right, TCP listeners, I have an incredible guest today. I'm really excited to have Dan Millman on the show today. Dan, how are you doing today? Oh, very well. Thank you very much, Ed. So, Dan, I mean, you've written a ton of works, but the one that, you know, often you get the most notoriety from is The Way of the Peaceful Warrior. Now, can you give us a little bit of a history on that book? Like, where did, where did it come from? And then, what, like, what's the history behind that? Why The Way of the Peaceful Warrior? Well, it remains a bit of a mystery how our lives unfold uh, unpredictably. Uh, uh, but I, I can say this. It, it all began when I discovered I loved swinging on ropes, climbing trees. And later on, I found an old trampoline and began jumping on it. And who knew that jumping up and down on a trampoline would lead to um, a scholarship to college, a world championship on that event? Um, I, end up, I ended up gymnastics coach at Stanford University and and uh, college professor at Oberlin, which is part of my official intro, I know. But the reason I mention it, it is an evolution. Um, I f- began focusing on how we can create more talent for sport, um, what qualities can we develop so we can learn faster and easier and rise to higher levels. That was a natural question to ask as an athlete and a coach. Um, but my interest expanded later and into the arena of everyday life because doing uh, athletic skills didn't necessarily help me when I got married or had children or dealt with financial challenges or career decisions, the, the things many of us are, are dealing with in our everyday lives. So uh, that question of how we can develop talent for living, um, what, what set of skills can we learn and develop that led me really around the world working with various mentors um, for over a decade it was just the obsession and dedication of my life whatever else i was doing i was always kind of became that traditional seeker and i was my sense of authenticity uh helped guide me and so i found some unusual teachers and experiences and practices and so on and it eventually it all mixed together and shaped into an approach to living I call the peaceful warrior's way. Part of the word stems from my martial arts background as well as in gymnastics, but um, it really refers to all of us. And I think that's why so many people have resonated with the way of the peaceful warrior, my signature book, Um, because all of us are peaceful warriors in training in the sense that I've never met anyone who isn't seeking to live with a more peaceful heart. Um, to, to breathe easier, to uh, deal with stress in a way that's more graceful. It's inevitable. It's part of our life, stress. But how do we deal with it with less tension? Um, how can we learn to flow with the changes of life? That's what I mean by that peaceful heart. But there are also times we need a warrior spirit mm-hmm. to roll up our sleeves, march into life, and face 
the spiritual weightlifting to temper our spirits we call daily life. So that's why I refer to that term peaceful warrior. It applies to all of us. That's why so many men and women resonate with that idea. And that I think is as good a summary as I can offer right now. That's beautiful. And I mean, you, I mean, you wrote this book in 1980. That was yes. when the first, it was first published, I think. Yes. Was it a complete success in the beginning? Uh, quite the contrary. <laughs> it was a, kind of a groundbreaking book, but people didn't know what to do with it because it's not exactly memoir. You see, when you write memoir, you're writing from your memory of what actually happened as accurately as you can put it down. Whereas my books, as a peaceful warrior, was most of it was autobiographical. It was based on my life. And that's how I structured it and things that really did happen. However, I mixed in fictional elements for the sake of story, the drama, the teaching. So the bookstores didn't know where to put it. Is it in fiction? Is it nonfiction? In fact, my editor subtitled the book, A Basically True Story, mm -hmm. which she thought was clever. And I did too, but the bookstores weren't amused. They didn't know where to put it. Remember, there were no online bookstores at this time, just shelves. You had to find out where to put the book. They didn't know where to put it. It was too strange for them. So the book died very quickly. Um, and I figured out, you know, I didn't have any expectations. I was hoping more people would like it, but it didn't get into many stores. So it went out of print and I couldn't get any interest in it for maybe, I don't know, three and a half years past. And then this old fellow, I, it's funny, it's ironic. I call him an old fellow. He was probably about a year or two younger than I am now. Um, but he was a retired publisher named Hal Kramer and he got a, somehow found a copy of, of, an out of print copy of the book, read it and said, I'm going back into publishing and I'm starting with this book. And it took him two years to get the book chains to take one copy in each store. But then something happened, which every author dreams of, and there's no way you can make happen. Word of mouth started. One person would tell another person who told another person who told two more. It got passed through the family, families, children to parents, parents to children, through the generations. And still, 30, well, 37 years later, um, it still sells you know, many copies or, or gets passed around or gets picked up in the library. Um, and so the book's still doing well. It's still relevant to the challenges of everyday life. Yeah, I would say it's actually just as relevant today as it was back then. Yeah. I mean, and it's just as impactful. Like even when I post it on social media, hey, I'm super, super excited. I'm going to be, you know, speaking with Dan and people are like, man, that book changed my life. Yeah, that must, what does that feel like for you when you hear someone say that book changed my life? Well, I've asked people, what do you mean by that? Because we change our lives. Books don't. But what the book, I think, accomplished, and again, I could not have strategized or figured this out. It just worked out that way. It happened to resonate. What it does is it offers a perspective about perhaps the promise of our lives and the bigger picture. It introduces us to the transcendent. Because most of us properly live our lives, conventional lives, day to day, doing what we need to do at school, at home, with children and whatnot, um, in our jobs, our careers. That's what life is about. That's conventional world. We need to pay attention to that. But many people, and that's why people sometimes follow religions or join groups or do spiritual practices, because there's a yearning for the transcendent to understand what that liberation is, that freedom, that sense of cosmic humor that can come with this breakthrough um, insights. And many people try various ways, whether it's psychotropic drugs or fasting or you know, chanting or many, many different paths. Uh, I won't go into them right now, but uh, to find the transcendent. And I guess Peaceful Warrior was an introduction to a transition, showing the, the transformational arc of this naive, self-absorbed, kind of arrogant young athlete I, I was to, to the uh, self-absorbed teacher I am today. <laughs> so um, it, it shows an evolutionary arc most people, men and women equally, can identify with uh, in this search and the mistakes we make on the way and what... Uh, what's at stake and what our potential may be in wait for us. Beautiful. And, you know, I want to kind of back up and, and reflect on a word that you've used inside of this interview already. And that word is authentic. Mm -hmm. You know, what does it mean to you? What does that word mean to you? And are you, you know, is the Dan Millman we see in here right now, are you authentic? 
Well, let me uh, give two examples. Somebody came up to me once and said, after a talk, and they said, Dan, I feel, I don't know, I think I'm feeling really inspired. I said, don't worry, it'll pass. Because inspiration comes and goes. So I don't, I'm not an inspirational speaker. Maybe I am sometimes, but that's not my goal. Because motivation, inspiration come and go. They wax and wane. And the other thing I'll say um, is people have asked me, have you mastered all that you teach, Dan? It's a fair question. You know, they say you, you teach what you need to learn. I must have needed to learn a lot with 17 books and counting um, over the last 30 years. But when I'm asked that question, have I mastered what I teach? The answer clearly is no. But I am practicing sincerely and I'm improving over time. And if you looked at my life, you'd probably find me a good example of what I teach, not a perfect one. So I couldn't ask any more of anyone. So we're all in process. So I'm trying to be authentic now, to be open and real. That's what it means to me. And that's the answer to your question. Um, there are many teachings today of various kinds. And some lead us deeper into illusion. Some promise us uh, magical solutions. If we just live in the present moment, everything will work out better. Well, there are there's certainly value in focusing and handling what's in front of us um, rather than getting lost in in uh, memory or imagination uh, of what we call the past and future. Sure, that's important, but there is no one stop and there is no best book or teacher, including mine. There's no best diet or religion or philosophy or path or, or form of exercise or martial art or anything else. There's only the best for each individual at a given time of their life. So, I think that's authentic, and I think that's realistic. Uh, there are teachers who say, I'm going to show you how to re-engineer what successful people do, analyze what they did, and you can do that too and succeed like them. Maybe, maybe not, mm -hmm. because people have different karma, different paths, different destinies. But in fact, I would say that we can control our efforts. Most people would agree with that. We can control our efforts, but we cannot control the outcomes. No one can guarantee us to teach us how to sink every putt or make every bas basket or find success or love. No one can guarantee that. But by making a good effort over time, we vastly increase the odds of getting our desired outcomes over not making it. So these, this is again, another realistic principle. So that's what the best way I can convey in your question about what is authenticity to me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think inside of your book and, and maybe I'm kind of paraphrasing or taking from, from uh, what I've read or maybe what I put into the way of the peaceful warrior was that, you know, Socrates basically said that the character was asleep and that he needed to wake up. And, you know, I see and I hear this thread inside of society today of men are sedated, that they're unconscious to a certain degree. Would you agree with that? Or, or do you have any thoughts on that of like how, how men have become sedated inside of, uh, you know, our businesses, inside of our relationships, uh, and our, even our spirituality? Sure. Yeah. Um, that's a, it's an apt metaphor the idea of being asleep or awake. And I guess the best way I can communicate that, Ed, is if we look at uh, when we go to sleep at night, everyone dreams. We may remember the dreams, we may not. Um, and it's not superior necessarily to do that. I'm, in fact, I need to interject a story. Um, I, I, I spoke with someone once who said, I do work with dreams and bring me your dreams next time we meet. Uh, and I said, oh, I don't remember my dreams. And they said, bring me your dreams. So I made a special effort. I woke up at night as soon as I noticed. I gave myself a suggestion at night. Nothing special, just I'm going to remember my dreams. And I'd wake up at night, and scribble things down. And I ended up with five single-spaced uh, single type pages of notes and dreams. Bizarre, all kinds of symbolic stuff. And so the point is, whether we remember them or not, we do dream at night. But. You, I'm sure you've heard of this, many of your listeners have, there is a state we can achieve called lucid dreaming, mm -hmm. where we actually know we're dreaming while we're dreaming. We don't wake up entirely. We, we are still in the dream, but we realize, oh, this is a dream. 
And there are techniques, there are technologies like flashing lights when we go into REM sleep, our eyes move around and it makes a flashing light and partly wakes us and it alerts us that we're dreaming. Another way is during everyday life to ask ourselves, am I dreaming this moment? And right now I would say, hmm, I look around, no, I'm not pounding the table. I'm, I think this is actually not a dream. Uh, I am speaking with Ed for real. Mm -hmm. um, and we, but if we ask ourselves that question all the time, then it's going to happen. One time we'll be dreaming and we'll go, am I dreaming? And we'll go, oh, wait, I am. So there are different techniques. The point is, once we achieve lucid dreaming, we are awake within the dream. And we can, the monster that's chasing us, we can go poof and make it disappear. We can fly at will. We can start to play in the dream rather than have it just happen to us. So then that raises the question of lucid waking. During our everyday life, we're in a kind of dream, a kind of trance, projecting onto the world all these beliefs and values and opinions, thinking we know the meanings of things and making up meanings for things. Um, so in a way, we create a dream. In, in the Hindu tradition, they call it maya. They say, life is maya, an illusion. Well, you know what? I don't quite get that. If I'm walking across the street and get hit by a truck, that ain't any illusion. Um, you know? So what do they mean by that? They mean we create an illusion of life, of the mystery of life arising as we live it. So whether we think so or not, most of us are asleep in a spiritual sense. I don't mean the, the kind of sense where we just sort of get dull and uh, go to the movies and, and aren't fully alive in that sense, but I want to say something about that later, how to really appreciate our life as a, a method. Um, it just means that we're looking at a filter. We look at the world through a filter. We perceive it. We hear it of our own beliefs, projections, associations, opinions, values, rather than letting life arise in its simplicity without all the extras we add on to it. That's why Barbara Rasp, a writer, said, the lesson is simple, the student is complicated. <laughs> and why Mark Twain once said, I've had many troubles in my life, most of which never happened. And Dan, if, if this, this kind of makes, you know, I'm listening to you and I'm just like, man, this, Dan has mastered this stuff. He's got this stuff down. Like, it, it's really easy to listen to you and just go, wow, this is incredible you know, the, the amount of knowledge and, and wisdom that you've gained. But also then I kind of reflect back and I go, but is Dan Millman actually a master? I, like after 17 books, or are you, st is, what are you working on? I guess is the question to master currently right now. What is Dan Millman working on? Well, you know, if you look at a female gymnast on the balance beam, it's one of the events for women. So that's why I'm using female as an example. Um, she loses her balance. When she's a beginner, she gets a little off and falls right off the beam. And with practice over time, she wobbles, almost falls, waves her arms, and then stays on the beam. And later, her mistakes get more and more subtle, so we hardly even see them. But nobody doesn't make any mistakes. There's no such thing if you look at a slow motion video of a perfect routine. So in the same way, life... Is, you know, even enlightenment, it's not a, like turning on a light switch. It's more like a dimmer switch that goes up and down, up and down. But over time, a little brighter. Two steps forward, one step back. So the idea of, of achieving a place, saying, I am a master now. Um, you know, I once got a black belt in, in Aikido, one of the martial arts. And now if I'm ever attacked on the street, I can whip out my certificate. The, the point is, it means you're a beginner. You're really ready to learn when you're a black belt. It's not the end point. You don't become a something. We're always becoming. We're always in the process of refining, practicing, improving. And I am too. But yes, I have gained a certain level of perspective, which is the better part of wisdom over time at my age. And I've been paying attention and working hard at it to understand what reality is about, what I'm about, um, what the human being is about. And many of my books reflect that. So, sure, I can be a good re resource to others. People occasionally write me an email through my website, uh, peacefulwarrior.com, and um, I do my best to respond. So I like being a resource for others, but it doesn't mean I'm not also – I mean, I just, I just uh, was a little careless and broke a, 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 a drinking uh, cup, uh, one of my family members, because I just, it, I just dropped it, and it broke. So, you know, I still make mistakes. I still don't pay attention closely enough sometimes. Um, 
so I'm in process like anybody. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I think we all are, aren't we? I mean, it's every For time sure. that I, even, I mean, every mentor, coach, anyone that I've ever had, they've all said, you know, hey, we are all still like we are in a work of process, progress, you could say, or process or progress. Dan, how do you, how do you feel about social media? I'm really kind of curious to know. It's hard for us to, you know, it's happening so quickly in a historical sense, how to make best use of it. We've all seen in the newspaper the complications of social media mixed with politics, uh, mixed with um, uh, enmity and, and, and anonymity and what happens. I think it's a tool. The internet's a great tool. I think the internet is the nervous system of the planet linking up. So we become more of a global village. Um, you know, there was a young boy who used to, uh, who wrote me a letter. I, I, we supported his family, gave a little money each month. It was like Foster Parents Plan, it was called, or Plan America. And we donated a little money each year to, to the, this boy. He was eight years old. And he, and he wrote in Swahili because, you know, uh, I didn't understand that. And he drew pictures. But now, 30 years later, um, I mean, we gave him some money to get a teaching credential and eventually we put him through college and we were able to do that. And, wow. and now we email back and forth. We can talk by Skype. So this is great. Uh, uh, we, we get, you know, Facebook and there are different things to stay in touch, but anything that can be used can be abused. Mm -hmm. When the photocopy machine was first invented, one of the first things people did was start photocopying dollar bills and then putting them in vending machines. <laughs> you know, people are very clever. And then they had to account for that. So um, the human awareness, you know, what, what is this said? We, we are living in a Star Wars technology with Stone Age emotions mm -hmm. <laughs> and sensibility. So we need to evolve to catch up. I mean, most of us have the experience of getting a new product, a technological thing, and having to have a learning curve to figure out how it works. Many of us, it's like almost a daily thing. There's a new app, a new something. We've got to figure out how this thing works. Um, and, and so we're still catching up. I think it's a good thing and it's a challenge, uh, these changes in communications. Yeah, I definitely find, you know, it's, it's a blessing and a curse in itself. You know, we are more connected and disconnected in the same, in the same sentence these yes. days, it almost seems, you know, I take my kids to go swimming lessons and parents are on their phone, on their mobile while I'm, you know, no, no judgment here, but I mean, I might yeah. be watching my kids and just sit watching them and intently. So it is, it's just, a, it's almost like you're sucked into that reality of, wow, this is, this is a completely different generation than when I grew up. And even when, again, you know, how you, when you wrote your book back in 1980, and yet still the principles of the book apply as much today as they did back then. And that's the beautiful thing of it. Um, so if, if we like, I know that you have a new book out as well, the, the Hidden School, The Return of the Peaceful Warrior. Why did you bring that book to light now? Why now? Well, it's a good question, a hard one to answer. Uh, my life, I describe more like improvisational comedy than, than strategic planning. Um, if I were smart, I would have just continued to do books just like Way of the Peaceful Warrior. Socrates would reappear and then teach me some more lessons. And that's what my readers probably wanted most. Um, and, but I didn't. Uh, I didn't write another book for 10 years. And then there was a slice, a small a page of the original book that I just referred to travels around the world. And I didn't say what I really experienced then. So I expanded that one page into uh, an, another adventure called Sacred Journey of the Peaceful Warrior. It takes place in a Hawaiian rainforest. Mm -hmm. And 37 years after writing the original book, I finally was ready to complete the story by taking another slice of that book. It begins just where that second book ends. So the point is they're not sequels. They both, both my other books take place within the pages of Way of the Peaceful Warrior and in a way complete the book, which explains how I was ready for that death and rebirth experience that happened at the end of Way of the Peaceful Warrior. So The Hidden School can be read with Way of the Peaceful Warrior after it, before it, it stands alone, but it makes more sense within the context of the original book. And what's different about this third, and the reason I wasn't ready to write it for 37 years, is it addresses more of an advanced training, an advanced teaching, uh, teachings of, of death um, and life. Uh, and I, I referred earlier in passing to an approach to how we can appreciate the life we were given in a way that 
Uh, most of us don't. It's too easy to take life for granted. Um, and in that book, in The Hidden School, my character goes through an experience where I go through a process of dying. Mm -hmm. And it's like a meditation. And so I just completed uh, an online course that will be available through my website. I have several online courses, a four minute workout, for example, the Peaceful Warrior Workout, um, and uh, a course called Master the Path of the Peaceful Warrior. Um, and these are all through my website, uh, online courses. But the new one, the four minute meditation is on the process of dying and all that we need to let go of in dying uh, psychologically speaking, of course, uh, in order finally to appreciate the gift we were given, the rarest of chances to be born a human being on planet Earth and to finally start to reawaken uh, and look at life through the eyes of a child again and how lucky we are just to be here on planet Earth. So that's why I created that, that four-minute meditation, which, yeah. So. Beautiful. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm going to encourage actually everyone who's listening today. So all our listeners are, listeners actually head over to peacefulwarrior.com and just check out, yeah, you have a, a ton of substance here. So, I mean, especially the people who have, who have read your, your works and want to dive deeper into, into learning more about really, again, just the way of the peaceful warrior, but also, um, I mean, you have so much more content and updates too, using, you know, audios and, and different things, the e-courses that they can download. So I'm going to encourage everyone to head over again. If you're actually on your mobile and you're listening, you can actually expand open the show notes and there will be a clickable link. You can head over on your mobile as well. Dan, I have another question for you as well. Sure. You know, in, inside of the, the way of the peaceful warrior, the book itself, there were so many lessons. There was so much value that was dropped. Was there any lesson or uh, knowledge bomb you could say that you dropped inside of that book that people actually misinterpreted that they got the wrong message or they just people got it wrong was there anything in the book that happened that way i think what comes up for me ed is that you know that saying we've all heard uh, when the student is ready the teacher appears and mm -hmm. many people say i felt sad after reading your book because i wish i had a teacher like socrates and that's one of the basic misunderstandings by the way for those who don't know my work he was an old gas station attendant played by nick nolte in the movie version of the book um that came out in 2006 uh, called peaceful warrior um but the old man I called Socrates, he wouldn't tell me his real name, but he reminded me of the ancient Greeks. So that's how I nicknamed him. And I wrote the book so my teacher could become the reader's teacher. I'm, I'm not here to hoard information or ideas or perspectives. That's why I wrote the book, to share with others. So the idea that when the student is ready, the teacher appears, it's not about somebody like Socrates appearing in their life to guide them through life they can find their guidance. They, they have the Socrates within them anyway and excellent books around to help. Uh, I think what that saying means is when the student is really ready, that is paying attention, the teacher appears everywhere. Friends, adversaries, a passing cloud, a bending tree, you know, in the wind can all teach us valuable lessons for life when we're paying attention. So that's a, the kind of misunderstanding people may have. And in fact, I wrote a book 20 years after Way of the Peaceful Warrior, maybe 25 years, called Wisdom of the Peaceful Warrior, which actually explained the teachings in the original book from my perspective 25 years later. So it's much more clear on, on, on those teachings in the book that it's easy to misunderstand. So true, though. I love this. And so before we kind of just wrap things up and, you know, I, I know that we only have so much time with you today and I wish we had more. Dan, I'm going to actually put you in our TCP time machine. So we have this cheesy time machine. So I'm actually going to put you in this. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, let's do this. Okay, so I'm going to actually put you in the TCP time machine. We're going to send you back to a younger version of yourself. Yeah. This is the younger version of yourself, 1980. You just finished your book. Mm -hmm. What would you impart? What valuable advice with the same experience and life knowledge that you have today, what would you tell that younger self? Something I wish I'd known earlier on would have made life easier and more powerful, I think, if I had just reminded myself, Dan, 
you, you, we each have individual lives. Don't compare your life to anyone else's. That's a show of disrespect for your process. Trust your process. Trust your life unfolding that wherever you step, path will appear. So what we're going to do is actually just send everyone over to your website. So if you can head over to peacefulwarrior.com and Dan, I gotta, I gotta say, I mean, this has been one of the most inspirational uh, podcast interviews that I've had to date. Now also listeners, if you like, you can head over to the chiropractic philanthropist.com. We'll have a webpage dedicated to our discussion with Dan as well. All the clickable links as well and resources that he's provided today. I want to thank you so much for giving to doctors today. Thank you, Ed. It's been a pleasure. So you've heard the struggles, you've heard the successes, and this episode is done. But there's still so much more to come and so much more to learn. Head on over to thechiropracticphilanthropist.com and sign up for our newsletter where you'll receive free practice building tips and strategies, including how to market your practice with your very own podcast and so much more. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on The Chiropractic Philanthropist.